Hello and thanks for tuning in to World News Update with John Moran. I'm your host, Finbar Markey. Every week I'm joined by John Moran, former head of the Foreign Desk for the Irish Press, and we look at international news stories. Uh, John starts off with giving us a general overview of what's been happening over the last week, and from there we discuss that in more detail. Uh, thanks for tuning in and joining us again this week, John. My pleasure, Finbar. And what have you got for us? Well, first of all, we have serious, very serious unrest in Kosovo. NATO is deploying an, an additional 700 NATO troops to northern Kosovo after 30 of its peacekeepers were injured in clashes with ethnic Serb protesters amid a long simmering dispute, bringing the total number of NATO forces in Kosovo to four and a half thousand. Quote, we have decided to deploy 700 more troops from the Operational Reserve Force for Western Balkans, unquote, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg told reporters in Oslo after talks with Norwegian Prime Minister Jonas Gar yesterday. He said NATO would also put an additional battalion of reserve forces on high readiness so that they can be deployed if needed. Some 50 Serbian protests were also injured in the violent protest. The conflict in Kosovo erupted in 1998 when separatist ethnic Albanians rebelled against Serbia's rule and the latter responded with a brutal crackdown. About 13,000 people, mainly ethnic Albanians, died in the conflict. Serbia has refused to recognize Kosovo's 2008 Declaration of Independence. Saudi applies to join the BRICS. The world's largest oil producer, Saudi, Saudi Arabia, is reportedly asking to join the BRICS group. The regional bloc comprising Brazil, Russia, India, and China, and South, America, South Africa has been touted as a serious counterweight to the Western-led international world order. Just a week ago, during his visit to Riyadh, South African President Cyril Ramaphosa announced that Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman expressed the kingdom's desire to join the BRICS. Saudi Arabia, which is home to 17% of the world's proven oil reserves, maintained close security and economic ties with the US for decades. But since the election of Joe Biden, Riyadh has steadily moved closer to US rivals like Russia and China. Earlier this month, the oil producing cartel OPEC Plus announced it would cut oil production by 2 million barrels a day. The US blasted Saudi Arabia for the move, saying it would directly support Russia and hurt US consumers ahead of next month's midterm elections. The BRICS countries have long called for new financial centers to counteract US dominated institutions like the IMF and the World Bank. Erdogan wins in Turkey, which unsettles the West. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan won a re-election in a runoff vote and maintained his position as the country's longest serving leader. Erdogan defeated opposition leader Kemal Kilikarduglu in his biggest political challenge in years. The victory cements his grip on Turkey, an important NATO member, despite mounting economic woes, skyrocketing inflation, and poor response to February's devastating earthquake. Western leaders had been quietly hoping Mr. Kili Dargoglu could win the election against Mr. Erdogan, who they view as being difficult and close to President Putin, to whom Mr. Erdogan made his first phone call. Some Western observers fear Mr. Erdogan may now pivot to Eurasia, and align to the development to the developing multipolar world. That was a good brief overview of, of some things happening around the world, John. Uh, we focus on Serbia and Turkey in particular, if you don't mind. In terms of Serbia and Kosovo, and John, so this whole Kosovo Serbia thing, what is it all about? From you know, some people are saying it's a domestic thing, and some other people are saying it's linked to the whole Russia Ukraine NATO conflict. What is it about? It is linked to Russia, but it, it displays a contrast in a different way that NATO treats Kosovo and the way it treats the Donbass. 
because the Donbass and Kosovo are two restive parts of two political entities. One was allowed to secede, the other wasn't. And the one was trampled into the ground, if I could put it that way, by the military. And in, in Kosovo, we get NATO troops helping the Kosovars. It'd be the, the equivalent would be NATO in Donbass helping the Donbass people, but they don't do that there. It's a different story. But the reason they don't like Serbia and why they gave a decision against Serbia on the independence front with Kosovo is because Serbia is linked to Russia. They are both they are both uh, of the same ethnic stock. And this this over this particular uh, minor conflict, which it is at the moment, is in regions of Kosovo that are uh, whose populations are mass mass majority Serbian. And there were elections uh, held by the Kosovan administration that the Serbian population did not participate in, did not trust. And so a single figure uh, percentages come out to vote in those uh, local elections. And from there, the Kosovan government is now imposing the uh, mayors on, into these local regions that were voted by that tiny, tiny minority. And that's what this is about. And that's what NATO was getting involved in, because we showed an image earlier while John was giving his overview on this issue that indicated and showed clearly that the majority of countries in the world don't actually recognize Kosovo as an independent state and still see it as a part of Serbia. So it's not as clear cut as people think. Do you think there's a possibility of another conflict in Europe in this Kosovo-Serbian region? Well, let me, let me give you another similarity. In, in Kosovo, 13,000 people died in the unrest when they were fighting for independence, it was 14,000 in the Donbass. Whereas in Kosovo, Kosovo the people, the United, the, the NATO troops came in to support the Kosovars. They didn't do that in Donbass. They did the reverse. They're against the Kosovars. It'd be the equivalent of NATO joining Serbia now to support the uh, reintegration uh, of Kosovo into the Serbian state. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, keep an eye on this because... It's an where... interesting, it's a very dangerous one. Yeah, yeah. And it could be a second war in Europe, if ever we thought we would see the day. But it looks like we, we just might see the day. Um, just focusing in now, John, on the story of the Turkish elections and Erdogan's uh, success in recent Turkish, the runoff last Sunday in recent Turkish presidential elections. Um, Erdogan does appear to be erring on the side of, of Russia. He's a, he's the ultimate tightrope walker from an international political point of view. He hasn't attended. So he won that uh, runoff election on Sunday. He was due at a European leaders summit. Uh, today and he hasn't gone to that summit he cancelled uh, his presence at that summit why is that do you think that's a an international policy decision or is it because he's not well because i've seen video footage of him recently and he's a very fail looking man uh almost needs assistance in, in walking and things like that why do you think he cancelled this summit is it a, is it a part of international policy well you're, you're you're right there are two possible answers to that uh, the illness when he hasn't been looking too well, he's been looking very tired. And the second one is more interesting in that the NATO countries were hoping that he wouldn't win, that it would be the other guy. So they're not that happy with that. He knows they're not happy with that. He might have a bee in his bonnet over that. But he his first phone call was to President Putin. So that will indicate that he is in line for the emergence of the multipolar world formula that we saw emerging. Yeah, yeah. Again, watch this space. I did see a video of Erdogan during the week where he was been given a drink of water by a member of staff who came from behind him. And he refused a drink of water from that member of staff. And the member of staff, while still behind him, gave the glass of water to Erdogan's son. And Erdogan's son handed the glass of water to him and he took it and drank it. And it seems to be that 
that's the lifestyle, is it, of, of leadership in the Middle East and places, maybe even around the world, that you can't even trust a glass of water. Well, can you imagine that the Middle East, you know, you're you're lying with, you know, some people who have been through the ringer for several decades of war all over the Middle East and with outside interests poking around for them set for their own interests at the same time. So you do get uh, people who have uh, various approaches to things that wouldn't be normal in this part of the world. Moving over to China, John, and Xi Ping Xi has um, made a statement, well, coming from the South China Post, we'll just actually have a look at this image now, uh, this headline, but has made a statement uh, saying, China faces more complex security challenges, President Xi Ping says, warns of worst case situation. Officials must stay keenly aware of challenges and prefer, prepare for the most extreme scenarios, uh, Xi Jinping tells National Security Commission. A comment shows China harbors no illusions about fallout of U.S. rivalry and has little hope of resolving or creating improvement in ties, analysts say. So we have that story about preparing for extreme scenarios. We also have a video that came out uh, over the last few days of a U.S. military aircraft that was buzzed, is the term, I believe, buzzed by Chinese fighter jets, which forced them away from the South China Sea. We'll have a look at that video. So here you can see that in front of us is a Chinese fighter jet. And it's it's certainly, we might say, um, shepherd dogging uh, the U.S. military aircraft away from Chinese airspace. The response I've seen to that is people giving out about the Chinese jets and things like that. But do you blame them? Could you imagine if a Chinese uh, military aircraft were flying off the coast of the United States, what what the Americans would do? Well, I think the Americans want to raise the temperature in the, their dispute with China. They want to start a war. There's no doubt about that. They've been sending Pelosi and all sorts of people over to to uh, Taiwan to uh, get up the nose of the Chinese leadership. And not only that, they've been selling lots of weapons to them at the same time, which is the act of an unfriendly nation. So... While we have one war already going on, remember that the United States was barely out of Afghanistan when it was into Ukraine. So don't at all be surprised if whatever happens in Ukraine, it might be kept as a, a low burning dispute. It might be frozen in conflict. It might be all sorts of things. But the, the war with China is one that America wants not America, but a certain group of deep state individuals who've been working in the State Department for many, many years and have had these plans all along. And I'm told that uh, practical common sense people in the Pentagon and the State Department are leaving. And they're leaving the madmen at the helm because they can't take it anymore. They won't, some of the marriages and ethically won't be a part of what's going on. And so the crazies have been left at the wheel. And that's very, very worrying. Uh, John, in terms of the chances of conflict with China over the next two to three years, is it high? Is it low? Well, I know that the Americans have war-gamed it to say that by 2025, China will have the wherewithal to defend himself against the United States, but up until that time, they won't. So if they're going to look for a war, it's going to be before 2025. There's also reports this week that the European leaders, or at least some of the European leaders, are getting a bit shaky about all this anti-China stuff and that they're not willing to follow the American line when it comes to creating a sanction regime against China and also a military regime against China. Do you think that the European leaders are bluffing it, that they're trying to talk from both sides of their mouth, or do you think that there's genuine concern? I, I do think that the more serious people will have a general a general concern about this talk. But um, unfortunately, they don't give any reason for hope that they would make any move to prevent such a war, even if they felt it was coming. 
if the Americans want something to happen with this generation of European leaders, they can have it. Mm. It's, it's very worrying. Again, we're going to watch this space and we're going to try to talk peace in this show while so many seem to be talking war. Uh, two stories left to cover, John. We're going to swing over now to South America. And uh, Lula da Silva, the president of uh, Brazil, again, every week he's making statements that are shaking things up in many respects. In this matter and in this case, it's about a new currency. We're going to look at a video of Lula da Silva talking about a new currency. And this is in the context of comments he's made where he says he would like to see a Central American and a South American joint currency. And again, this is challenging the dominance of the dollar. We'll have a look at this video. We'll come back in a few seconds. Eu sonhei, sonho em que a gente possa ter outras moedas para a gente fazer negociação e não ficar dependente só do dólar. Sabe, eu, eu não posso dizer porque eu não sou ministro da Fazenda, eu não sei qual é as coisas, mas, por exemplo, o Maduro não tem dólar para pagar as suas exportações. Quem sabe ele começa a pagar yuan, quem sabe a gente possa, sabe, receber outra moeda de outro país para que a gente possa trocar. É culpa dele? Não, é culpa dos Estados Unidos, que fez um bloqueio extremamente exagerado. Eu sempre acho que o bloqueio é pior do que uma guerra. Porque a guerra, normalmente, morre soldado que está em batalha. Mas o bloqueio mata criança, mata mulheres, mata pessoas que não têm nada a ver com a disputa ideológica que está em jogo. Então, eu sonho com a moeda diferente do dólar para que a gente possa negociar sabe, com os nossos países fornecedores de produtos e os países que compram de nós. Since Lula da Silva has been elected, he has on the world scene uh, been doing a lot of moves towards joining this effort for a multipolar world. What you're taking Lula da Silva, is he sincere, do you think? I do, actually. And uh, they're fed up in Latin America with the whole Monroe Doctrine, where the US sees them not as sovereign countries, but as the American backyard, where they can do what they like. And there's a bit of this whole multipolar thing and the de-dollarization that people don't get. Countries that have suffered from colonialism can see what's happening now far more clearly than countries who weren't involved in it. European countries were all involved in, almost all of them were involved in colonialism. So they can see very closely what's going on. But in Ireland, I think we can, where the last vestiges of power that these countries have over the former colony is desired to be thrown off as soon as possible. Now, the world has seen this opportunity with a multipolar world and with structures that are going to be into it, like a new world bank that's not connected to America and uh, new organizations, organizations representing the world that isn't just the white world, that isn't just the Western world, that isn't just former colonial powers and this is the change that we are witnessing and uh, I think that we in Ireland can see that uh, more than others perhaps. Isn't that the phony kind of a story and the phony world that we were being sold in the noughties in the 2000s when we were being told that through globalization and business we can have a world that works together and is in synchronicity together and um, that was all just a charade on the part of the United States, was it? Because in the space of a few years, that's all been thrown in the, in the trash can. And what we're left with is threats of war around the world, uh, disassociation of associations. It, it's just a terrible situation. And for it to all have fallen apart so quickly, it's a real, real shame. Well, when you think of um, Muammar Gaddafi, one of the last things he was talking about was an African currency. And some people have actually blamed that on the reason why Libya was invaded. They didn't want that in Africa. That was a big challenge to the United States. 
But now they're going to face that challenge. There will be a currency in Africa. There will be a currency in Latin America. There will be currencies other than the all-controlling, all-powerful dollar. And that's going to be the new world order. At the same time that the United States is extending its debt ceiling or its borrowing uh, capacity to $4 trillion. And it's just phenomenal that the dollar is in a state of international collapse at the moment. And they're going to print $4 trillion more. <laughs> and I think the United States at some point into the near future is under threat of hyperinflation if it doesn't rein itself in. Just on the subject of Gaddafi, I suppose, in many ways, staying in South America and with the multipolar uh, world uh, context or topic, uh, the president of Venezuela, Maduro, has been brought out from the cold or in from the cold again. And just like Gaddafi was, I suppose, but this time with more uh, reliable compadres, uh, such as Lula da Silva and the leaders of South America who came together this week in a conference. And without a doubt, from a press point of view, Maduro was the most popular man or woman at that conference. We'll have a look at this video. We'll come back in a few seconds. Muy bien, siempre son buenas reuniones. Reanimando el espíritu de el diálogo de Bogotá. Hay que reanimar el espíritu del diálogo de Bogotá donde asistieron 20 países. Mantenerlo vivo. Pronto voy a recibir un grupo de cancilleres de los países participantes. En... There's a video of Maduro being surrounded by, by press, being uh, hounded by press, some might say. A lot of American press there as well. Most po popular man at the summit. What do you make of Maduro being taken in from the cold? Well, they, the people and the press there, they all know there is a new world order. There's a new dispensation. And the smaller countries will be able to gather with other larger countries who don't want to exploit them, don't want to tell them what to do, don't want to put army bases in their country to ensure their compliance. They want a, an open, free world where people can do business without any war, without any of this one party in charge who decides everything. And, and call it a the international world order, which is an absolute nonsense. John, that's all we have time for uh, this week. Thanks for joining us again. Uh, folks, thanks for tuning in. Like, share, subscribe where you can. We're battling the algorithms. Uh, our, the topics and what we talk about are not what the mainstream media and the, the government and governments around Europe and the United States want us to talk about, or at least from the angles that we take it. So we're battling the algorithm. So we do appreciate a like and a share and a subscribe where you can. Thanks for joining, joining us again this week, John. My pleasure, Finbar.